And in chapter 3, verse 28, Paul will say, For we hold or we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of law. What he's saying is that your salvation is dependent upon faith in God and faith in this blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's not dependent upon you getting all the rules right and living good enough. Because if you can't live good enough, somebody else has got to pull you out of that. Chapter 4, he shows how this has always been the case. It's always been the case that anyone who was ever saved was saved by grace through faith. And he uses Abraham as an example of that. And, and, and so he, he still springboards off of that thesis. And then we get to chapter 5. And in chapter 5, he kind of jumps back here to 328. Now, we maintain that man is justified by faith apart from works of law. And he springboards into this chapter and he says, all right, now we're going to get to some really, really good stuff in case that wasn't good enough already. He says in chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, and from that point on, all the way down through verse 11, he is going to extol the blessings and the glorious things that we possess individually when we have put our faith in Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. We are reconciled to God, made friends with Him again. And he talks about the hope, the reasonable expectation of heaven that we have. And so it's that micro view again, kind of like in chapter 2 where I said he went, way, boom, came down here in that micro view of sinners. Now he's looking at the micro view in 5, 1 through 11 of what it means to be saved by grace through faith and the blessings that come along with it. Well, beginning in verse 12, he does the opposite of what he did about sin. He started in tight. Now he's going to zoom this thing way out. And he's going to get the macro view of how does the grace of God impact humanity? Has it? Has the grace of God changed the existence of mankind as a whole? You better believe it has. The question is how? That's where we're going to pick up. We're going to pick up in 12 through 21, and I want you to see in the few minutes that we have tonight how it is that the grace of God is so abundantly wonderful and overpowering of anything sin could ever do in your life. Begin reading with me in chapter 5, verse 12. He's going to give for us a, a description of just how bad things are for humanity. He says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. And yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Now, listen, when you, when you start opening up commentaries and you start looking at what a lot of different preachers say, they're going to go to Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21, and they're going to start saying how this is one of the, 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 great, uh, the great texts of the Bible that epitomizes the, the doctrine of original sin. Let me just put this to, to rest. It doesn't. It does not teach that we are born inherently bearing the sin, uh, genetically bearing the sin of Adam, the guilt of Adam. It's not what it says at all. I'm not going to get into all the reasons why, because if we do that, we can get so muddied down in it that we miss the bigger picture. And I want you to see the bigger picture of this right now. What he paints for us in these first few verses is the picture of just how bad things are for the world. He said, he, look at some of the words that he uses. So, so sin came into the world through one man. And who is that one man? It's Adam. Adam, Adam in, in his initial act of disobedience, brought a force, issued in a force into this world that we've been wrestling with ever since. And when sin came into this world, what was riding on its coattails? Death. For the wages of sin is death. That's the salary you get when you sin. It's what you earn. That's what you deserve. 
And he'll make statements like sin was in the world before the law was given. And, and I, kind of the idea is people were... It's, the, it's this pointing back to moral law. How did God reckon sin to people before He'd given the law of Moses? Well, there was a moral law. It is that, that, that ultimate concept of right and wrong that God has written on our hearts. That's chapter 2. We can talk about that another time. Just trust me for this moment on that, okay? And he says sin reigned even in ways in which people sinned that wasn't quite like Adam's. Well, that'll mess with your head a little bit, right? Because what, how did Adam sin? Adam sinned because God said, here's a line, don't cross it. Moral law will tell you that there are times where you may not actually have seen a complete line drawn in the sand, but deep in your heart you knew it was wrong to do and you did it anyway. And you're guilty of sin. But I want you to notice the major word that he uses here in this. And yet, verse 14, death did what? Death reigned from Adam until Moses. Death was in control. It was the dictator. It was the tyrant. Whatever death said is what people did. Whatever sin wanted people to do, sin had control, death had control. There was no pulling ourselves up out of this mess. And that's a pretty bad situation for mankind to be in, is it not? It's a hopeless situation. You have no way out of it. In verse 15, however, we begin to see a change in Paul's tune or at least a, this glimmer of hope that comes around because he says here, but the free gift is not like the trespass. What free gift are we talking about? We're talking about the free gift of God's grace, the free gift of the declaration of innocence that is not dependent upon me earning it, but that it is imputed to me by God through my obedient faith. And what he does in 15, going down through verse 17, is he begins to lay out this, this contrast. You, if you had a piece of paper, you could put these side by side. And he's going to put, he's going to begin to describe here what, what in scholarly circles they might call two epoch heads. E-P-O-C-H, or epoch is what I keep hearing people say nowadays. That may be the right way to say it, but that the pronunciation just grates on my nerves. But these two epoch heads... Two men who represent, are being used as representatives of entire categories of, human, of humanity. One is Adam, the other is Christ. Did you know that in your spiritual walk, you are positioned in one of two places? You are either in Adam or you are in Christ. And those existences are very, very different. And he begins to contrast the difference between them. And if, you, and if you're into highlighting in your Bible or you're making notes off to the side or you're underlining, I want you to go down through here at some point, even if you do it right now, and I want you to underline the different phrases that show the contrast. He will say here, staying in verse 15, that the free gift is not like the trespass. Why is that? He says, for many, for if many died through the, man, the one man's trespass, much more, watch this, you're going to see that term much more over and over and over in chapter 5, much more abounding above and beyond have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Now beginning in verse 16, he's going to tell you why these two are so different. He's already said one resulted in death and the other resulted in life. But he says that that's just it. The free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. You want to be in Adam, your, life, your spiritual life is going to have one type of result. You be in Christ, if you are able to be in Christ, then your life has a completely different destiny. And he'll go through. Notice the things that he says. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. If you are in Adam, here's what you get to look forward to. Condemnation. That's a heavy word. That's a heavy, heavy word. It's something, it's not merely just making a judgment. 
The Bible will speak to us that there is a, there is a need for us as, as Christians, as God-minded people to make certain judgments about things, right? You're, you're, you're taking scenarios laid out in front of you and you're, you're making a determination about the facts that are laid in front of you. And our world doesn't like to hear that. We don't like to hear that concept of judgment and whatnot. But, but, but listen, we're, we're not talking about just simply laying out facts and, and making a decision based upon the facts in front of you. The judgment, the decision that follows as a result of Adam's sin, of being in Adam, is condemnation. Condemnation is so much more uh, crucial and critical because here's what condemnation means. It means it is a judgment of guilt combined with the condemning penalty that goes along with it. When you get to a legal system, and, and we still have it in pockets of our nation today, when you get, when you get a man who's, who's, who has uh, committed a capital crime, and in some states they will still give the condemning penalty of death, If your life is characterized by being in Adam, by being reigned over by death, then what you have to look forward to is condemnation. Not just God saying, okay, you're a sinner, but the declaration of your guilt along with the condemning penalty of eternal separation from God. But the free gift following many trespasses, all it took was Adam to mess up one time and he brought sin into this world and he set in motion this force that, that we've been contending with and one sin, one sin brought this power into play and we've all joined Adam in on the ride. We've all sinned. But after many trespasses had been committed, here comes Jesus. And after many trespasses... The free gift following many trespasses brought justification. What did I tell you earlier justification means? It is a declaration of innocence. A little homespun definition is to be justified means to be made just as if I'd never sinned. What does the free gift do? The free gift of grace brings about a declaration of innocence. It removes the guilt of the sin from my record. And if there is no guilt on my record, then what is there also not going to be for me and for those of us who are in Christ when we stand before the ultimate judgment? There will be no condemnation. Didn't we just sing about it? There is no condemnation. Do you know where that comes from? Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Is that not good news, church? That is a statement of confidence, a statement of peace. Verse 17, he'll keep on going. If because of one man's trespass, death reigned through the one man. There's that tyrannical reign again. You, you, the, you, death has its thumb down over the top of us. And, and, and what does that look like for death to reign over and in us? Let me tell you what it looks like. It looks like everyone who's terrified of this earth being all that there is. You ever met people who are in slavery? Who are under a dictator's reign? There's not a whole lot of hope in that existence, is there? They, they don't think, I mean, they think about freedom, but they don't get to enjoy concepts of freedom. They spend a lot of their time worrying about what's going to get taken away from them next. If death is reigning over us, what do, a lot of, what, what, what do people who, who have no hope about life after this, what do they spend all of their time running away from? Running away from death. Running away from the concept of having everything that they have taken away from them. And so they, they pile on, pile on, pile on, pile on. They're trying to cheat death. They're trying to, to make sure that they have some legacy that they get to leave because, because I don't want death to take all this away from me. One trespass resulted in death reigning. 
much more than. If because of one man's trespass death reigned in Adam, death reigns, much more, there it is again, will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of life, free gift of righteousness, reign in life through the one man Jesus Christ. Now, you see a difference right there. There's still a reigning that takes place here. Curious question though. Who's doing the reigning in verse 17? If I ask you who reigns in righteousness, our instinctive reaction would be, well, it's Jesus. Jesus is King of kings, Lord of lords. And amen, He is. But Paul makes an interesting statement that those who receive the abundance of grace, they have a change that takes place. They become the ones who reign in righteousness. Now, what does he mean? Does that mean I get to have authority alongside of Jesus? No, that's not what that means at all. But if you consider the two conditions side by side, in Adam... What does death do to me? It reigns over me. It gives me a state of existence of I am the slave. I am the worthless pauper. I am the one who has no hope of ever getting out of this hole that I live in. But in Christ, what do I now have? In Christ, I now have been exalted to a new status. I have been taken from the pauper in Adam to the child of the King in Christ. What's the difference between being an Adam and in Christ? It's the status of your existence. Wouldn't you rather exist as a king or a queen? Wouldn't you rather exist as royalty instead of existing as the scum of the earth pauper out here in the streets wallowing around in, in refuse? I would. And I can't pull myself out of that one, but Jesus can. Jesus can and Jesus has for all those who reach out and receive this gift of grace through faith. Do you see how this is stacking up here? Which of these is the better existence? It's not Adam's, that's for sure. But he'll keep on going in verse 18. And in verse 18, going down to the end of the section here, he's going to tell for us, now that he's contrasted the two, he's making it abundantly clear that if you get to choose which of these, exi- which of these epic heads you, you live under... You don't want to be in Adam. You want to be in Christ. And he's going to give us one more reason because he's going to show to us in verses 18 through 21 that there is no power that sin and death can have over you that God's grace can't undo. Now that's hard for some of us to say because we don't want to believe that. And again, it's because there have been those that have abused the concept Set the abuse aside. Listen to what the apostle, the inspired, God-breathed author is saying. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification, declaration of innocence, and life for all men. For as, the, by, for as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so then by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Look at the difference. Sinners. Um, condemnation. Sinners under Adam. Justified. Righteous under Christ. That word righteous means about like what it says, to be made right. To be made just. How is that possible? Well, he'll give us a little little expounding upon the concept of law. He'll say there, now law came in in order to increase the trespass. How does law increase a trespass? Well, if I tell you in my big backyard that doesn't actually have a fence in it, if I say don't go too far away from the house, you understand I've laid down a rule, right? Don't go too far from the house. But there may not be a complete understanding as to how far is too far. What happens when I put a fence down? You know how far is too far. Why did God give the law? He gave the law so that people would now finally begin to understand just how far away from God they had gotten. Law was given so that sin would increase. But watch it. Verse 20. But where sin increased, grace abounded 
all the more. I want you to put a little note in your Bible around that word abounded. It's not just, okay, he did a little bit more than what sin could do. That word means super abounded. God puts law in place, and law has a purpose. Law has a very good purpose from when, coming from God. We need law. Who wants to live in a society where there are no laws, right? We need law. And law serves a very good purpose. One of its primary purposes is to show us just how wicked sin is and how much God hates sin. And it's to show us how far away from God we've gotten. And when you realize how far away from God you've gotten, when you realize that being in Adam means that you're going to have condemnation, you're going to have death reigning over you, you're going to have a status of existence as that of a pauper down in the slime and the muck of the streets, it seems that no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, you just keep making it worse and worse and worse, right? That's what law does to you when you try to depend upon it to make you whole. But what Paul has just said here is that every time when sin increases, as sin is racking up, when Christ came along, Christ's work overcame everything Adam did. Grace superabounds far above and exceedingly beyond what we can do. I, 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 you know, there's a lot of people in this world who, who look at it and they say, well, I just don't understand how God could forgive me of the sin that I've done. Guess what? You don't necessarily have to understand it, but I'm here to tell you that if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, God's grace can overcome the sin in your life. God's grace can make you whole. God's grace gives you the one and only blessing and opportunity to be in heaven one day. Because without the grace of God, you have no hope. So as sin reigned in death, Grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you believe that God's grace can superabound above your sin? I hope you do. Because if you will believe it, if you can trust that God's grace is that powerful, then you're going to put your trust in Jesus Christ because that's the only way you're going to receive God's grace. And there may be people who are here tonight that, that, that you're here. In fact, I know there are people here tonight that you, you are still wallowing around in the muck and mire and death is reigning over you. You are living in Adam. And I hope you begin to understand how bad of an existence that is. And once you realize how bad of an existence that is, I hope you start looking around for answers to get yourself out of it. Except when you go looking for answers, I want you to realize you're never going to pull yourself out of that situation. You're going to have to rely on Jesus. And if you're here tonight and you're in Adam, but you want to be in Christ, you want to give your life to Him, you can do that. You can come in obedient faith and obey the gospel. Confess Jesus as your Lord. Repent of your sins. Be baptized into Christ Jesus through the, through the baptism of water, immersion in water. And you will rise a recipient of God's grace. Ready to walk in a new life. Or maybe you are a Christian and you, you've not allowed God's grace to actually be what it's supposed to be in your life. Maybe, maybe you allowed God to save you by grace initially, but you've turned around and you've started trying to take the reins away from God. That's not going to work either you still got to let God's grace take control of your life. And maybe, maybe you need to turn your trust and your hope back to Him. Let go of the reins. Let God be the one that guides you. Let God be the one that saves you. Because you'll never save yourself. And if we can pray with you and for you for strength and humility to let go of that and to let God do it, we want to help you with it. Whatever we can do, however we can serve you, however we can love you, let us know right now while we stand and sing.